Hi everyone, this is the Ignoramus's Guide to Surviving Humanity. I'm Eliana Chan with my co-host. Anne Montavon. And today we have the pleasure of talking with Dr. Coop, Dr. Tina, Dr. <laughs> Tina Cooper Smith. Hi. Hey, hey. And, and Dr. Coop is, she wears very many hats with the OBGYN specialist. Eliana wanted me to. A fertility specialist. <laughs> <laughs> Which I am not the person to do that. Um, but that's why. I didn't I, say I was going to micromanage no. you. From the back. <laughs> yeah. Great. And she's going to talk to us. Yeah. About like a lot of areas of ignorance around um, medicine, around uh, sort of new thoughts of medicine, new schools of medicine that are coming up, and also just like everything sort of wellness, women wellness, sexuality, and uh, I mean, we can talk about men too, can't we? We don't, it's not just women. Yeah, as a fertility doctor, I talk with men all the time, so <laughs> kind of fun to be a gynecologist who treats men. <laughs> <laughs> There, well, one thing that I, I have a lot of selfish curiosity for, because now I'm in the geriatric, uh, Thanks. That, you know, it's like the geri. once you're 35, I believe that's when you start being the geriatric for pregnancies. Um, and I fall into that, uh, Ileana and I had a discussion like a year and a half ago where, cause I had read as soon as you're 35, um, every month your it goes down some percentage for your ability to become pregnant until I've got my my primary care physician saying that uh, I have to get pregnant before I'm 40 or because of the stress there's no chance of me becoming pregnant so, so these are all things that I want to know. Yeah. So let me, let me clear that up a little bit, because again, part of my whole concept, even on wellness and the medical profession, right, is so much of the medical profession is fear-based, illness-based, takes the power away from the patient, right? Oh, just come to me and I'll fix you. You don't have the answers. You don't know what you can do, right? And, and I'm just so... I, I just live the opposite of that. So 35 is important, but it's really important for people to understand how 35 got picked out of the hat, right? So way back when we started looking at genetic problems and you know, having a, a baby with Down syndrome was the big one, right? Like people are scared to have to raise a child with special needs and the risk so how did we diagnose if your baby had Down syndrome? So the first technology that we had to diagnose that was to do an amniocentesis. So at about 16 weeks pregnancy, they would put this needle you know, through your tummy into the baby's sack and take a little bit of the fluid out. And the fluid had ex exfoliated cells from the baby and they could then check the chromosomes and count how many chromosomes. And you could find out if the baby was balanced, right? Is it a 46XX girl or a 46XY boy? Or is there an extra chromosome 21, which was Down syndrome? So that that's a needle into the, the, the amniotic sac. We're making a hole in the pregnancy sac. And there are risks that go with that, right? So you might lose the whole pregnancy. You might have an infection. You might go into preterm labor, which leads to a problem. So the, the initial... Um, uh, the initial analysis was that the risk of the procedure, one in 200 pregnancies or one in 250 pregnancies, I think, could be lost from the procedure itself. Well, at 35, the risk of having a child with a chromosomal anomaly or a Down syndrome baby was about one in 250. So 35 was the break-even mark. The risk of the problem was the same as the risk of the test to find the problem. So that's how 35 got picked as the number of advanced maternal age, okay? Now, as we've looked over time and we look at fertility curves, we see that the chance of getting pregnant kind of is like this. It goes down a little bit per year, right, from the time. But it's pretty, pretty stable. And then somewhere after age 35, 
the curve takes an exponential dive and goes down. And the flip curve, the risk of a miscarriage is kind of stable at 10 to 15%. And then somewhere after 35, it starts rising exponentially. So that by 40, your risk of a miscarriage is 30%. And by 45, it's one in two. Okay, it's 50%. So again, the two curves, we find that in most individuals, the cross point of fertility and miscarriage is around your mid thirties. Okay. So it, it like, Oh, look at that. The DNA problem and this for the balance of miscarriage and likelihood of getting pregnancy all seems to start to change in that mid to late thirties. And so that's where that number of advanced maternal age 35 got put into place. But People have been having babies up in their late 30s and early 40s for decades, right? But the numbers start to change. And so we also have this paradigm in Western medicine since Darwin's theory that DNA is the be all end all blueprint for everything. And it is the key to health and wellness. And there's this, uh, these voices on the fringe that are getting more and more, they're getting louder, those voices that are telling us, you know, DNA isn't everything. And we have to start looking at other things. And I think we're seeing that now. So did that answer your question? Yeah, thank okay. you. Well, we also say, so the mathematicians who, you know, they're really genius, right? And they say, like, if you're going to freeze your eggs because you're nervous that you're single and you don't have a kid yet, and when are you, when should you do it and all that? So if you freeze your eggs before the age of 34, or flip side, you haven't done it yet, and now you're 34, you're going to maximize the chance that one of those eggs is going to be good for you and work and it's going to be successful, but you may not need it, right? You might need them decide to have a baby at 35, 36, 37. You have sex once you get pregnant. Oh, I didn't even need to spend that money. Why did I put the investment, right? It's the insurance policy. It's an investment. If you make it to 37 and you haven't frozen your eggs yet, and now you're like, should I still do it? They say that if you freeze by 37, you actually maximize financially. It's your break even point, because if you're 37 and you're not going to try till you're 40 or 41, there's that much more likelihood you're going to have to spend money on fertility treatments. So why not be your own egg donor and put your eggs away? And and it's probably in your best interest financially, although you've waited three years, so it may or may not work. Right. So Mm -hmm. it's these two bookend points, right? Of, well, do I, I'm only 33. Should I really freeze my eggs or I'm 39? Did I lose, did I lose out? Right. And we still can do it at 33. We can still do it at 39, but we're just, we're, we're, we're weighing the emotional impact, financial impact, you know, will it work? Will it not work? And these are all unknowns. Hmm. And one thing that Ileana and I were discussing um, years ago as well, was a keto diet and different different things mm. in that realm and, and their effects on fertility. And I imagine that because we have such shitty food here, that that does have an impact. On- yeah. So my thing big time is a whole foods diet, right? And limiting sugar. So sugar (laughs) is evil. Pesticides are evil. Chemicals are evil, right? And so fertility, I think, is the epitome of we need to be well to have a baby. And that means psychological wellness. That means physical wellness. That means emotional wellness. And to me, that means energetic wellness. And I, Eliana has heard me talk about the four bodies, which is the whole sexuality blueprint blew open my vision of wellness because I realized that 
we don't go through life with one physical body. And that's the brainwashing of the Western medicine allopathic story. That Can you back up for a second yeah. and just like um, explain what the blueprint? Um, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Explain. Sorry. <laughs> it's so funny. So the erotic blueprints was something designed by Jaya, who's a sexologist. And she teaches that everybody's nervous system is wired a little bit differently. And the way they access pleasure might be differently. It might be different. Each indiv- I think each individual actually has a fingerprint, right? And we access pleasure and pleasure is our birthright, right? We are not put on this planet to be miserable. Look, no other animal was put on this planet to be ill and miserable and suffer. So why do we as humans think, oh no, but we have to be miserable. Like we have to get ill and we, like it makes no sense, right? So the human condition is we're, yeah, we're the only one with consciousness to think about our experience on life or so we think, right? But we can't really be different than other animals. And so our, we're here to just be. And if we're here to just be, we're here to have wellness and pleasure and we're here to reproduce, right? Because all animals reproduce. So how do we come together to reproduce all we have these. So anyway, back to the blueprints. So the blueprints are how do we access pleasure? And for some people, we access pleasure through anticipation, longing, slowness. It's we got to like take life in gently. And that's sort of the energetic blueprint. Um, And other people, we access pleasure through deep touch and massage. We feel all the senses fully and we get pleasure by really feeling all our senses, the taste, the touch, the feel, the smell. And then there are other folks who access pleasure through the physicality of sex and their body. And they just, they live in their body they live in moving their body. They live in the physicality. They need sex to them is how they feel pleasure, right? It just, it's air, food, and water. It just is. And then there's another whole set of folks who access pleasure through mind play and role playing and being creative. And similarly, they need deep stimulation, pinches, slaps, touch, you know, um, all different kinds of more kinky ways to feel your body, right? She calls it the kink. And I think they live more in their mind body, right? And they need to be, they need the stronger stimulation to actually be woken up to live in their body so that they, it pulls them into their body from their mind because they're off in creative land, right? And then there are the shape shifters, which basically can play in all those blueprints. They also can get pleasure from everything. And they need it all. They need like one day they're one thing, another day they're another, right? And so I think we all have these four bodies and we all have, but we have them developed to different levels. And so our nervous system are wired, like what's familiar is one way in and we can work with our nervous system to our nervous system are, are plastic. We have plus, you know, the, the neural plasticity and we can develop new connections if we play in other blueprints and we can develop new ways to access pleasure. But our bodies intrinsically can pull in pleasure from all these different ways. And we pull in wellness the same way. So we, when I started to, like learn about that, I realized we go through life with four bodies. We have a thought, an image, an emotion, and a body sensation for every experience we have, right? So we have four bodies going through life always. And so when we're trying to heal somebody, we can't focus on one body. We have to focus on all four bodies. 
And that's what ancient medical wellness systems taught us. But we've been hijacked into believing this Western system of wellness and illness, which I think was developed by one blueprint. So the, the patriarchal white male system that has kind of hijacked human civilization for the last hundred thousand years, right? I don't know. I, I, I don't know how many years have we been, has it been male versus white male? I, you know, I don't know the, I'm not the historian, but those folks over time became much, their blueprint is very much black and white. Here's the physical body. This is how we see things. It's reductionistic. It's the, you know, let's do an autopsy, figure out the organs and design medicine based on those organs. But when we think of, well, yeah, when we think of the universe and the universe is an interconnectedness and the, the macrocosm is the microcosm and our, we have an interconnectedness to all other species on the planet we're not at the top and we're, there's no hierarchy. It's a spider web. And that's the same thing with our bodies. We don't have one body of just the physical. It's an interconnectedness of all the inputs that come in, the energy coming in, it circulates around. We have reactions and emotions to everything that comes in. We have our physical body. We have the stories we tell ourselves. That's the mental body. And everything is interrelated. And sex and wellness is like the epitome of all four bodies coming together. It's so interesting that you're mentioning that uh, the patriarchy sort of, and I would add to that the capitalism aspect yeah. of it as well. Because we did our first book that we ever did <laughs> um, for this podcast was an American sickness. And it very much it very much illustrates how the American healthcare system is completely based on this physical, very narrow definition of wellness. And because it's so capitalistic and like just anecdotally, I think having navigated the American healthcare system, it's like if you go for, you know, I've, I've had this um, experience myself and other people have like, you know, you have like your wellness check, like that's free, well, free in, in terms of it's included in your insurance plan. But if you go into that um that uh, what you, appointment with your doctor, and you happen to say one thing outside <laughs> of that test, they can actually charge you a different fee, you know, for this wellness test, because now yeah. it's no longer covered under insurance. So that means that you can't say anything like how you're feeling or like, if you, you know, you feel like you have a problem or anything that you, you know, you can't say anything like that or else it's like $150, $250 charge right off the bat. So yeah. it's like, it's like the opposite of a holistic. Well, approach. and it's the wellness system or the, it, the illness system be, be then also became hijacked by the insurance system, right. right? So the doctors are not autonomous because they don't get paid. They can't even charge what they're worth. They can't charge they get what the insurance feels like charging and the insurance agents make the rules and they don't even have any, any knowledge of wellness and illness, right? And it's, you're right, it's also based on this competitive nature of, of kind of, you know, Western civilization and capitalism is, it's money making, it's comp competition. So doctors are no longer, it's like, when I'm supposed to be there to help you heal, but, but it's like, but I don't get, I only get paid X or I get paid Y and I want to make money and it's so messed up. <laughs> <laughs> so curious, how, it, how is your practice set up? Are you with a group? Do you independently... Um, so I am basically on my own. I have an associate, you know, we have a few, a doctor in the office, we share space and stuff and I take insurance plans, but 
it's funny because I've just tried to re um, I have a lot of patients who don't have insurance coverage or don't have insurance coverage for things like fertility. And I see a lot of patients who have um, insurance coverage, but they don't want to see their doctors on their HMO plan. So they pay me outside their plan to come see me. So I'm trying to actually change. I'd like to change my structure and actually have, we've designed fertility packages so that it's basically shared risk. Like give me three months of your life. Here's what it's going to be. And then I don't have to worry about, well, I really want this blood test today, but you don't want to pay for it but I think I need it. Or I want to do three ultrasounds. You only want to pay me for two ultrasounds because you don't have them. Like, I want to get the money part out of like, here's the fee. If I get you pregnant in one month, I'm sorry, you paid for three. If it takes me three months, you don't have to go get another loan. Right. And not that I charge that much that they need loans, but it's, if they do IVF, some of them too, but, but it, yeah. it's just the system and how it, it, it doesn't work in people's best interest for their own health and wellness. Yeah. I feel it's like that too probably much. takes off the stress from them. Right. Yeah. Because it's too much to negotiate per like to actually have to negotiate with your doctor and what you think is, is, you know, right for you, but where's the doctor is the expert. So it's like, it's just such an awful position to be like, no, I don't want this because I can't afford it. Like it's just well, and against medical advice against medical is advice. a term we've used for many years in the medical profession. And when I was dealing with, I guess I forget if it was in my coaching or my functional medicine stuff, but all that really means is that the patient and the doctor hasn't agreed on a common goal, right? Because the common goal may be, I really do want to be well. But I don't have, this is X number of dollars and I can't pay for this medicine. Or I'd love to come to the office, but I have three kids at home who are sick and I can't take the day off and leave my sick kid at home so I can't visit you, right? Telehealth in the COVID pandemic has changed so much, right? Because why are we making 90 year old people who are frail pay for a trip to the doctor and a cab ride and an assistant and one of their daughters has to take off from work and drive them in when someone can be at their house and take their blood pressure, their pulse, and they could go on a video screen and talk to their doctor and see what's up. And then maybe they, oh, you're sick enough, you gotta take an ambulance to go to the hospital, you don't have to come to my office, right? Or, oh, you're doing great right? Why did three people have to take off the day of work or spend their limited resources taking a special van to have a five minute chat with the doctor? Like, why are we the slowest of professions to move into the modern age, right? So again, it's how can we think outside so much of, I think what's going to come down the pipeline is changing the wellness system and how do we reach out to people and people can't take a day off of work to go to the doctor. Sometimes that is the difference between eating or not eating. And so isn't it more important that they eat? So, you know how you were talking about that, the four body um, concept, which I feel like I really, I like that idea because it makes sense to me, just sort of scientifically it makes sense to me because we've got to incorporate everything and go holistically forwards. Um, but the thing is, because it's sort of been maligned a lot, like sort of like woo-woo, um, everything that's not sort of mm -hmm. a phys the physical body is considered kind of bull crap, you know. <laughs> um, but having said that, there are people – because there is this sort of gray area of, of new thoughts and ideas that aren't of the traditional medicine. I mean, well, I guess traditional medicine sounds like wrong, but well, you know it's what I mean? allopathic Western medicine versus Western. other right. healthcare modalities. And I, I think you don't know what you don't know. And the problem with Western allopathic medicine was 
living in a silo, not being open to knowing what you don't know. And again, I think I've talked to Eliana about this before that the way Western medicine got their linchpin hold on our country and then the world was back in the early 1900s when there were so many competing um, healthcare modalities in our country. And it was a, a white male commissioned another white male to go visit all the schools in our country. And he concluded at the end of his treatise that the only one that was scientific was allopathic medicine. They were the only ones doing appropriate studies and they closed numerous black medical schools. They, all the acupuncturists were, you know, 5,000 years of acupuncture was just, we don't get it, but they were xenophobes, right? And so they didn't understand it. They couldn't prove it. So that didn't count. Herbal medicine and herbalist was more, monopolized more by women. And again, they didn't understand it and they didn't spend time studying it. So they just said, forget it. They took childbirth and women midwives and said, no, 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 no. We're gonna tell you what's right for you and kicked women out of the birthing rooms, right? The Flexner report in the early 1900s, basically a white male paid an educator white male to go visit all the, um, healthcare schools in the country. And those schools, there was homeopathy, there was naturopathy, there was acupuncture, chiropractic, physical therapy, allopathic medicine, osteopathic medicine, homeopathy, right? There were all these different schools. And he decided that the only scientific schools, the only schools based in any science that he could understand was allopathic medicine. And those were run by white males, basically only 6% of the um, admitting class were allowed to be women. Um, he closed a number of black medical schools. Again, I don't think blacks were allowed into the white male medical school system. The acupuncturists were considered woo woo. You know, they weren't scientific. Now that school of treatment had been around for thousands of years. So they weren't like, studying it where allopathic medicine was brand new. So they were studying it. Um, naturopathy was how to use diet and herbs, right? And the herbalists were just dissed, even though herbal medicine had been around for thousands of years, right? And so again, it's important that we bring science into healthcare and wellness. And I'm not at all dissing the advancements that Western medicine and science, and science has done. But now we're seeing with science, we are using modern day science to learn about benefits from these non-scientific healthcare modalities. So now we're able to use functional, med functional MRI and like meditation changes the brain. Mm -hmm. Prayer is a form of meditation and it actually changes the brain. And for years, there's been, they've done studies that people involved in religion actually have better health. Well, that made no sense scientifically. And yet now we're looking at it and, oh, there's a feeling of belonging when you're in a group, which relaxes the nervous system and decreases your stress. Oh, you meditate when you go to church by saying the rosary over and over or the Shema over and over or bowing down to Allah and surrendering to the energy of the universe. You actually change your brain. Oh, we see that. So we don't know what we don't know. And we've had years of closing the door of scientifically studying these things because they narrowed the definition of what was allowed to be considered in the healing camp. Let's throw out the herbs. Oh, but the herbs work. And maybe the herbs work better when you take the plant rather than when you make the drug. And maybe there's less side effects, right? And maybe some drugs are great and sub drugs we need, but let's look at it all together, right? 
And functional medicine teaches us to go deeper than just naming and, and it, we call it name and blame. We get a name, we get a diagnosis, and then we say it's this. And functional, so let's, oh yeah, you have gallstones. Well, why do you have gallstones? Oh, maybe you don't digest fats well. Oh, well, why don't you digest fats well? Oh, your motility of your gut is too slow. Oh, why is your motility of your gut too slow? Oh, maybe you're so stressed out that you're living in fight or flight mode because you've been traumatized since childhood. And so your body has stopped digesting food and the nervous system and you're, you're lacking in magnesium or you're lacking in B vitamins because you grew up on food stuff like macaroni and cheese and, and Doritos and soda. And you thought those were food. And you were mad at your mother who told you to eat your vegetables because no one told you your vegetables were actually nutrition. But so that's what I like, I think, about our time in terms of um, we have a, a maybe a wider understanding of science in that like now I think science is being, I mean, yes, of course, as though there is the wider frame of science being political, obviously what's being funded is political, you know, dependent on capitalism, et cetera. But also there is still, because they're seeing that, oh, you know what, there is a lot of money to be made on looking at all these other areas. And so there seems to be more focus on source, like what causes these things, like what causes Alzheimer's, what causes diabetes versus just like the, the symptoms. Um, but how, because I think, well, I guess my question is because traditionally or historically, it's always been the physical body, the allo, what, what did you say? The allo, it's called allopathic medicine, the allopathic medicine is the only legitimate medicine. Everything else is not legitimate. Sometimes we kind of get into this space with people who are just like anti-science like they believe in, uh, you know, and suddenly like they're anti-vaxxers, they're anti-maskers, they're anti, you know, like they just believe in 5G caused COVID, you know, but they're also like, they're also in that space of thinking of, you know, they would probably love your idea of the four bodies, you know, so it's kind of this gray area where it's like anything that is an allopathic a science or a medicine is now just like equivalent. So how do you sort through those things? Like as you sort of I think, embrace new ideas? Yeah, so I think it's, we have to look at it and be all inclusive. And we have to be humble as well, right? Like we don't know what we don't know. So let's keep probing. Let, you know, we all thought that the, all the planets revolved around the earth until we realized they revolved around the sun, right? So group think is always dangerous. And the disruptors are the ones who raise the questions. And traditionally scientists have been disruptors, right? And so let's make room for all the voices and then say, wow, that's an interesting theory. Let's delve deeper and let's look at, you know, scientifically, let's look at herbs, let's look at nutrition. And we like to make boxes, low side effect, high side effect, low impact, likely impact, right? And, you know, if I had cancer, I'd probably do chemotherapy and surgery and radiation, right? But I'd also want to eat right. And I'd probably meditate every day on how can I keep my thoughts in the here and the now and not live in the what ifs and the anxiety of, oh my God, I may die tomorrow, right? So I want to use all the technology in, to me, meditation is its own technology, right? And I, I want to use it all. I want to use the energy of the earth right? It's really easy to go out in nature and appreciate, oh my God, how awesome is this planet I'm living on? 
Will I really get energy from the earth grounding me in electrons from the earth's magnetic field to heal me? I don't know, but there's no risk in going to outside and lying on the grass and taking in nature. So let the scientists keep studying this and maybe we'll learn it. Is there any harm in going you know, on the weekend to hang out with the people who are my people and say, can you pray for me? Cause I'm sick and I need your help. And maybe there's some benefit to that prayer. It's not, it's not dangerous to pray. It's <laughs> only dangerous when we say my prayer is better than your prayer. And I'm going to kill you over your freaking prayer. Like that makes no sense. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's studying the science of all these things. Yeah, it's sort of, I, I, I mean, I kind of think of it as having a scientific approach, but an open mind and a curiosity. Right. Like, but I think the scientific approach is really important in terms of, you know, the rigor in terms of experimental, experimenting research and like continual um, gathering of information. That's really important rather than just like 5G COVID you know, and then no questions asked about how you got right. to that conclusion. But people also forget that they, um, true scientific inquiry comes from the first case study and the first thinking outside the box and the first, first disruptor to go, oh, how interesting this person noticed this and so did this one and so did this one. And so randomized controlled trials, which are essential, but they're not the be all end all of everything. And remembering that your patients, you know, doc, I wonder if, when I started this medicine, I started to feel why. Is it possible that that's related? Mm -hmm. And sometimes they get blown off as, oh, that's just an idiosyncratic side effect. You, you're the only one, it can't be you. We're again, remaining open-minded and say, oh, wow, let's start looking at that. And let's start, maybe you onto something. And again, having, Western science, remember wisdom and start designing. They have, we have to understand the randomized controlled trials are important, but also people's individual experiences have their own wisdom and they may design the next randomized controlled trial from it. It sort of has to start with that spark and then the um, rigorous um, right. follow-ups, yeah. And opening up the conversation and to all different ways of thinking, right? And getting different voices at the table, right? We've been taught that Darwin and DNA is the center of everything. And we've gone down this narrow-minded path all about Darwin and DNA. And I've recently read some books that say, what about the cytoplasm? What about the cell membrane? If you get rid of the nucleus and the DNA of the cell, the cell is still alive until it runs out of machinery and it no longer has the DNA to make new machinery. But if you take the cell membrane away, there's no more cell. So what's more important to the cell, the cell membrane or the DNA? And the cell membrane controls what comes inside and outside the cell. And what comes inside the cell binds to the DNA and turns the DNA on or off. So that's what we call epigenetics. And we used to not believe in it, but now we believe in it. And that was Lamarck's theory of evolution. And he talked about it at the same time as Darwin did DNA, right? And so again, it's reopening and staying curious to all these different theories. So explain to us what epigenics is for us ignoramuses. So 
<laughs> yeah. So <laughs> DNA is your DNA. It's your blueprint in your cell that tells your cell how to make proteins and how to make RNA. And we have lots of DNA and only a small part of the DNA actually quote unquote codes for these proteins and this RNA. The DNA is coiled tightly and it has to be uncoiled to be, for it to be read basically. It's like a closed book and we have to open the book to read the words on the page. And so molecules come in and bind to the DNA and methyl groups close the book and acetyl groups open the book. Methyl has one carbon, acetyl has two carbons, right? So it depends on the molecules that come into the cell that then go into the nucleus that then bind to the DNA proteins on the DNA that decide which gene are we going to turn on today? Which gene are we going to turn off today? And so your DNA is not your fate because if you eat differently, then there's different molecules. If you think differently, then there's different molecules. If you live in Japan versus America, then there's different molecules. And so you're, and you're, the cell membrane determine what comes in and what goes out. So you could be dealt a yucky hand of DNA that is at high likelihood, let's say for cancer, but you eat well, you think well, you go out in nature, you exercise, and those tumor suppressive genes never get, um, you know, they're always turned on suppressing tumors so you don't develop a cancer. Many of us, so we've heard about the BRCA gene that increases the odds of getting breast cancer. Well, if you were born in the 1930s, your risk of breast cancer with that mutation was something like 30%, whereas today it's 70%. The DNA didn't change, but our environment changed. So you're much more likely. And then I have a patient who came to see me, right? Everyone in her family, you know, had cancer and she was convinced she was going to have one of these genes, but she didn't. And I said, well, is there anything different? She says, well, they all smoked, they all drank, they all ate like <laughs> crap. I'm like, well, they're obese. She's thin. She exercises. She doesn't smoke. Right. So they weren't dealt, you know, if you grew up next to Chernobyl, right. I don't care how good your genes are. If you lived in Okinawa, not Okinawa. Um, oh my God, Hiroshima, when the nuclear bomb went off, you could have the best genes in the world. The likelihood you got cancer was really high because your exposure to radiation levels was really high, right? So it's, again, it's the interconnection of the environment, which we call the exposome, everything you're exposed to and your DNA. And then there's wow. the whole microbiome that we haven't even talked about, right? So are we human or are we mother earth to all the bacteria, viruses, and fungi that live on us? And then mm -hmm. antibiotics kill off so many, or we're born by C-section. So we were never gifted the strong microbiome that we were supposed to be gifted at birth. So we started from less- Can you explain that bacteria. more? So we didn't know before. about the microbiome, right? So yeah. what we're learning now, right, is when a, a baby is born through the vagina, right? They're inhaling and ingesting an entire forest, if you will, <laughs> of bacteria, right? Yeah. But when you're born by C-section, we're cleansing the skin and the skin oh. and we think is also cleaner oh. than the vagina, right? Oh, and yeah. so this baby is never gets the entire microbiome that the mom was supposed to gift them. So they're already, so they're now starting to swab the vagina and swab the baby's face with mom's bacteria. But you need that bacteria. Yeah, the, that, the bacteria, termites, right? We all know termites and they eat houses, right? They eat <laughs> yeah. wood. You know, if the, if the termite did not have bacteria in their gut, they couldn't eat wood. Mm. Okay, so it's the bacteria in the termite gut that actually do the digesting. Our bacteria wow. in our gut are what help us digest our food. 
and our 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 intestines. Seventy percent of our immune system lives in the intestine. Ninety percent of our neurotransmitters, right? All that happy juice, that serotonin that everybody's taking Prozac for, 90% of it lives in our gut. So the bacteria that live there are probably pretty important Mm. because they help us digest our food, get the amino acids that are the precursors to make serotonin. And if we're not eating the foods that give us the amino acids, we can't make the serotonin. If we take a lot of antibiotics or we don't breastfeed, breastfeeding gives um, immune cells, but it also gives the skin bacteria that they don't put that in formula. So these babies have a different intestinal gut lining. Again, is it bad or good? The kid's here. The kid didn't die in childbirth, right? Or mom didn't die in childbirth. You didn't die of scarlet fever as age two if you were given penicillin for strep infection. So nothing is ever all good or all bad. That's right. That's the polarity play, right? Yeah. So we just have to start expanding our thought processes and start realizing we don't know it all yet. And we'll never know it all. But just for those of us who were not breastfed, and <laughs> my mom still feels bad about that, but like... <laughs> I wasn't breastfed either. <laughs> I wasn't breastfed. And it, you I know, was, at the time sorry. that I was born, it wasn't like, they didn't have an awareness around how important that was. Yeah, so it was no, kind of, of like, oh, it's difficult, it, well then just formula <laughs> or whatever. Right. In the uh, 70s, it was discouraged. Yeah, yeah, and I was, I was like born, if you were so. if you had if you had made it in the capitalist society, <laughs> it was better for a woman to bottle feed than breastfeed, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So so I was at the end the tail end of that. But so for us, or like, you know, just nowadays, like with our very unvaried diet, what how do we fix this microbiome thing? <laughs> Well, again, you're right. So the very big question. Static. Nothing is static and nothing is good versus bad, right? So again, we just have to, now that we know about it, make sure you're eating fermented vegetables. Make sure you're eating, uh, when you take antibiotics, take a probiotic to replenish it. If you get a cold, don't rush to go on antibiotics right? Let your body, you know, help the healthy bacteria along, right? Um, We're learning, you know, as we become more and more living in a sterile environment with all these antibacterial soaps and triclosan in hospitals killing everything, we're getting more and more autoimmune disorders because our immune system is confused. So it's probably going to get worse. You play in the dirt, you're less likely to get sick from an autoimmune disorder. So again, the pendulum is always swinging and our knowledge is always changing. So eat probiotic foods, eat prebiotic foods, stay away from antibiotics. You know, I used to give a preventative antibiotic every time I did surgery practically because we were so scared of infection. So for the 1% of infection, we were hurting 99% of folks. So now we have to pick and choose. Certain surgeries don't need the preventative antibiotic. Some still do because the risk is high enough. But if I give an antibiotic, I'm going to tell my patient to take probiotics for 30 days Mm -hmm. and eat fermented foods and eat probiotic, prebiotic foods, which we actually want to water the garden of our microbiome onion, garlic, leeks, plantains. If you eat potatoes or rice, cook them and eat them when they're cold, they go down as a resistant starch at room temperature and they're food for the microbiome. And when they're really, really hot, they're not as healthy, right? Who knew that's crazy. But so learning how to eat, um, eating pickles, sauerkraut, fermented beets, right? All this stuff. Um, herbs. So oregano and garlic and rosemary and thyme, um, 
Those are all actually herbal antibiotics. So the more we start using herbs, the more we're naturally helping the balance of the microbiome. So if somebody wanted to learn how to kind of tailor their diet to all of this, is are there websites or books or where would you guide them to figure all this oh, out? There's so many books <laughs> and podcasts now. It's like, um, you know, I would, uh, there's a book I just started reading called Eat to Live by, mm -hmm. again, a, a medical doctor who was a researcher on cancer and angiogenesis. And he's talking about, let's go back to basics and learn about nutrition. Um, there's the metabolic approach to cancer. There's a book on mitochondria and regeneration. Um, you can find functional medicine practitioners who are all about going into the root cause of disease. There's functional medicine dietitians. Um, uh, Michael Hyman, uh, Mark Hyman is, um, has a podcast, um, and book, the food fix, um, brain body diet is a really good one. A book by Sarah Gottfried, again, a physician about mid, um, the body there's just there's so lists and lists of books <laughs> and podcasts, um, right. you know, and just remembering that you know, and then the stress, the balance of stress and relaxation. When we live in the stress mode and we're, um, we, we talk about the fight or flight system and the sympathetic nervous system being all about, that's our survival system because it helps us run away from the predator. But the parasympathetic system governs digestion and governs reproduction. And so again, what's more important for survival? Well, you need to eat to survive and you need to reproduce to survive your genes into the next generation. So again, remembering that when we go, 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 go and push, 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 push and live in the fight or flight system, we're actually killing ourselves. So remembering to balance your life and if you have antibiotics, you have to have probiotics. If you're, if you're busy at work, you gotta have downtime to relax. Like it's just learning to balance everything and that wellness comes in the balance. So what would you tell to Anne who has a huge resistance to meditation? <laughs> like how to start for people that find it impossible? So, you know, I, I guess I tell people two things. So first is if you were a couch potato and didn't like to walk around the block or move your body, as a physician, you would understand me because you've heard for so many years how important it is to move your body that you wouldn't argue with me that you knew it's good to move your body and you'd accept that it's good for you. And then you'd have to get the motivation to do it, right? Meditation is how we exercise our mind body. And it's how we exercise and use both the dominant and the non-dominant brain. And it literally is a way to lift weights for the brain. And it's so for me to not tell you to exercise your mind body would be wrong of me as a physician. And I teach people, if you're a couch potato and you can't run five miles, but you can walk around the block or you walk to your mailbox and back, that was one repetition that was exercise for you and you're heading in the right direction. And when it's hard to meditate, hard to meditate, right? But by trying, you're actually doing it. So just by sitting on the cushion for five minutes and saying, I'm trying to meditate, I'm trying to meditate, I'm trying to meditate, <laughs> you're actually doing the work and you're lifting the, you're lifting the barbell. And what people forget is your brain is going to think. 
It will always think. What you're trying to do in meditation is be aware that you're thinking and say, but I don't want to focus on my thinking thoughts. I want to focus on something else, whether it's a mantra or a breath or the movement of my feet if I'm doing a walking meditation, right? So I'm actually training my brain to stay, have an int- have I put, I make an intention to have attention on something other than my thought. Mm. But my thought, my brain is going to want to go back to the familiar, which is thinking. And in the toggle of, I'm not thinking about my thoughts. Oh, I'm thinking about my thoughts. I'm not thinking about my thoughts. I'm, you're toggling. And that's like a rep of the barbell. And every time you sit and try to have an intention to not think about your thoughts, you're doing the work. And don't beat yourself up when it's hard. It was when you were learning to walk, you were cruising as a toddler, not a, you know, a crawler, and you would fall and you would get back up and you would fall and you would get back up. But you knew that your body wanted to walk. And so you kept going. And we've stopped teaching meditation to children. But in old, you know, ancient religions, right, or ancient times, you taught children how to pray or how to say a mantra over and over again. They were meditating. So as an adult, it's harder to learn to run. As an adult, it's harder to learn to play an instrument. As an adult, it's harder to learn to meditate. But if you stick with it, you'll, you'll eventually get the benefits. Sorry, that was a long ass. <laughs> no, that was great. Which yeah. basically yeah. just says, don't feel wrong when it's hard. But if you can sit there for five, it start with five minutes a day. Are you convinced? <laughs> I, I was convinced. <laughs> well, no, it's the, I've always gotten the uh, try meditating for better sleep. But it's through, because I'm Buddhist and I'll chant, which is, you know, within what you're saying, a form of meditation. Well, that's meditation. Yeah. So it's just my, my resistance is sleep and meditation because meditation doesn't always allow, like ever, that's what everybody says. Oh, just meditate and you'll go to sleep and it's fine, but it's not. That's my resistance in the meditation. Mm. Well, when do you chant? In the morning, I don't chant at night. So why don't you do an afternoon chant? Yeah. And add the second chant to your day and see what happens. So everybody's way to meditate is different, right? And I always tell people it's, I may like a mantra, you might like breathing, you might like chanting, right? Someone likes a walking meditation, something, somebody needs a moving yoga meditation. So how we're all different. And I would be fine with, uh, evening yoga. So do like evening a, yoga every day. Yeah, that's fine. If that counts as meditation, great. I'm good to go. Yeah. See how it goes. Yeah. It's just the sitting there and being still. And that's the one that I have the resistance against. Yeah. So figure out what works for you. Awesome. I learned so much. <laughs> thank you yeah, so, so thank much. Thank you so much, Tina. Dr. Coop, I mean. <laughs> Dr. Coop. Dr. Kapina, whatever you want to call me, right? It's just a label. It's just an identity. I'm more than my labels. Do you as have are a- all of you? <laughs> Thank you. Do you have any parting words of wisdom, or just anything you want to say to um, wrap this up? Remember that we all have divine wisdom within us, and honor your divine wisdom when you walk around in the world, and when you see your doctor when you see your therapist, when you see your meditation teacher, and when you see your kink master, right? (laughs) Remember your own divine wisdom. That would be my parting words. Be you. 